You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more about this show and my other show enthusiasts, plus to get the latest interviews, K-pop news, album reviews, and so much more, subscribe to the show's free newsletter at 17karatkpop.substack.com. Enjoy the show! Welcome back to 17 Karat K-pop. Before you listen to this episode, I do want to clarify that I really, really tried practicing my pronunciation. There are some words in this episode I may be mispronouncing or sounding like I'm clearly not a native speaker, and I really do apologize. I really have been practicing. Some pronunciations just don't come naturally to me as an English speaker, but people's names especially really matter, so I really, really, really do try to get it right. And I'm always open to corrections, so you're more than welcome to give me feedback about, hey, you didn't say that correctly. But I mean no disrespect, and I really just care about getting this right. Today's topic, all things C-pop, and Chinese music history period, and how it differs from J-pop, K-pop, etc. There is just so much to get to, so we are just diving right in. Going way back to the pretty much beginning of time when it comes to music being a thing. There's a fascinating book by Martin Puckner called Culture, The Story of Us from Cave Art to K-Pop. I'll link to the book on my site. It's interesting. He talks about, at the beginning of the book, two main kinds of views of what culture is. One is the perspective that culture is something you buy and you own and you keep. It belongs to someone. Another broad view of culture is that it's something that is seen for everyone and is meant to just kind of be universally owned. We all have it. We take it and use it. The artists give it to us. Any type of media. It becomes ours and we share it and that's a big part of culture. This outlook was promoted heavily by a Chinese traveler, Xuan Zain who went to India, and then he brought Buddhist manuscripts back home to China, and he started realizing how much he believed that, that culture was meant to be shared, it wasn't something with a finite amount of it, and people had to be selfish about it, and that really shaped the worldview at that time there. And in China, the first music system, or one of the first, was really developed. Like music notes, period, and their meaning came from China in the 3rd millennium BC. Confucius really believed in music's power to connect people, be used in celebrations, be a powerful force for good. His influence led people feeling like they now had permission to engage in music, that it was okay and meant for special occasions. So it became, from the earliest days of it, affiliated with good memory special occasions. During the Han Dynasty, 206 BC to 220 AD, there was a music bureau established to gather and edit ancient music, folk songs, literally ancient music. And actually, for many years, lyrics were seen as irrelevant. They saw music as so powerful on its own, instrumentally, that lyrics were not really a thought at first. That you could stir feelings in people, get music across, not because people hear it, but they feel it. Then, the Beijing Opera started. Well before Western civilizations ever used music notes, they were created in China and determined to be associated with certain planets and months of the year. Religious music especially was pretty specific, like you were expected to just sing that religious song at the time that corresponded to it. Whatever month it was supposed to be associated with, that was the scheduled time you could sing that. It's kind of like the Catholic Church equivalent of believing death would result if you played a certain chord in a church. People did believe, maybe superstitiously, in the power of music. Because if a dynasty failed, people would blame what they called an improper absolute pitch. The world sang in the wrong pitch, and we got bad luck, that dynasty, because of it. In 1949, the People's Republic of China was established, and this instrument, the arhu, became one you could just play on your own. The sound of it was reminiscent of Mao Zedong's reign, because it sounded like his military, so it became kind of affiliated with him. Mao Zedong actually really wanted music to be associated with that military, so he had the sons of the masses, as he called them, embraced. Sons that were pretty basic, repetitive, easy to remember, could get stuck in your head and be repeated like a mantra, a patriotic mantra. Lots of changes were afoot, though, in the 60s. Canvas folk songs were big, like Olive Tree. Western pop songs started becoming influential. 
In the mid-60s, there was the Cultural Revolution that started when lots of symbols of what they would call the old ways of thinking were destroyed. Paintings, statues, historical buildings. A new cultural era was kind of forced into being. And so a lot changed to their music world in the 70s. That was when more Japanese and Korean influences really started to show themselves. Plus, more songs from Chinese artists were being written in English and or Mandarin when the standard was Cantonese. A Billboard correspondent in the 70s, Hans Ebert, is the one who first coined the term Canto Rock, Cantonese Rock. Canto Pop was not yet a thing. It was, but it didn't have that term yet. The music did spread quite a bit, thanks to TV and movies a lot. The first Cantonese theme song for a drama aired in Hong Kong by an artist called Sandra, called A Miracle of Laughters and Tears. So OSTs became this early way to promote localized music, specifically in Hong Kong, because the demand in Hong Kong was for Cantonese songs. In 1974, RTHK, Radio Television Hong Kong, started airing and promoting Canto Pop on a channel. It would then pioneer a Canto Pop song chart and the Gold Songs Awards. The Cultural Revolution ended in 76 upon Mao Zedong's death. So after Canto Rock and Canto Pop had an early period of success, then the 80s came and the focus became heavy rock. Then in the 90s and in the 80s some, Canto Pop also became big in a new way. It had a bigger second wave, and it was considered to be kind of just in its prime. Canto Pop was very popular for its genre blending and distinctness, as opposed to the 70s. The 80s had a lot more Canto Pop with a visual component. The Hong Kong Coliseum, other local venues, were really big. That specific venue was a key one to have the music scene really stop and realize, hey, there's a lot of money to be made in the live music market. Since the 80s, Cash, the Composers and Authors Society of Hong Kong, has given out music awards, and in the mid-80s, Winnie Yu became the general manager at CR2, a commercial radio station. She set up a new policy that would promote local canto pop tunes all the time, and by the end of 88, canto pop accounted for 90% of that program's content. Before the 90s, media was territorialized, and Hong Kong was known for just having two free TV channels and three radio stations. Very small media reach. Big changes were afoot because of the rise of cable and satellite. This is when we had one of the main first clashes with Mando Pop competing with Canto Pop. Mandarin became threatening to the Cantonese pop popularity. Now in Hong Kong, you could watch way more than just Canto Pop programs. You could check out a lot of Mandarin-speaking programs and other programs. And so record companies started placing more bets and investing more in lifting up Mando Pop instead. Some Canto Pop stars even pivoted and started singing in Mandarin. Mando Pop also had an edge over Canto Pop because it was easier to make. Canto pop is different. It takes a long time to write a canto pop song by comparison because Cantonese is a language that changes based on how you pronounce stuff. So it's tonal, it's very nuanced. Translating it into a new version would take forever too. So canto pop songs are, they require a long time and with a music industry that just keeps getting faster, delivering mando pop became a better bet for quantity's sake. Down the timeline, we will get back to the decline in Canto Pop and full replacement, really, with Mando Pop in terms of popularity. We'll get to that later on. But note the rumblings of an issue in Canto Pop by comparison were already there in the 80s and 90s, relatively soon after its peak. The 80s had music shows, explicit promo of Canto Pop, big Canto Pop stars, pop and rock were really thriving in part because of all the artists and college students forming these art groups together and promoting their stuff. A lot of youth were getting involved in music. Some recording studios were still just state-run, very censored. But a lot of state-run studios lost subsidies in 1989, 90, and really needed to make a profit stat. So they really loosened up the censors to let more artists record there easier. They lowered the threshold to record there, and that really changed the game. In 89 was the Tiananmen Square protest, with pop and rock artist songs becoming big protest anthems. Nothing to My Name was really big for that, by Soi Jian, aka Soi Jen. He's really considered a father of C-pop and C-rock. 
So much miscellaneous stuff of note was happening in Hong Kong, in mainland China, regarding the music world. So this will not be very coherent and clear, so I won't really transition smoothly here. Lots of random updates in this part of the timeline. So here are just some things that happened throughout the 90s. Hong Kong was really thriving with its Coliseum, really started getting a ton of money from it. Back in 89, they had sold over 1.3 million tickets for a total profit that was about half the value of the local songs combined total sales. New folk music, aka NFM, was pretty big. A new spin on folk music, it was kind of referring to a concept, a cultural milestone, more than the genre though. NFM was like a whole, yeah, concept and strategy and holistic way of promoting a song. The economic prosperity in Japan really helped trigger interest and attention that led to the success of NFM. This new spin on a classic style was also viewed as essential by the radio outlets in Beijing who just were trying really hard to attract younger listeners again. Wave 1 was defined more by Western influences. Wave 2 was more live performance focused. And Wave 3 was defined more by concepts and marketing changes. So different waves exploring different aspects of promoting this new and improved sound. The Metro broadcast in Hong Kong started broadcasting Canto Pop in 91. They also started an award show. In the 90s, five of the biggest international record companies set up shop in Asia and started promoting there. Not just business, lots was coming to Hong Kong and mainland China. In the 90s, early aughts, the Pacific Coffee Company, McDonald's, Starbucks... Juan Kakwe, the lead singer of the group Beyond, died on stage. He fell off the stage, died from internal bleeding afterwards, because he spent days in a coma after he fell. It was really horrifying. Again, not connected to the other stories here, just blips in the timeline I find very notable. Between 1990 and 1994, music sales in Asia were up 660%, in large part thanks to gold record status achieving soundtracks for Disney stuff. Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Since then, Disney has really seized on this momentum there, and Cantonese covers of Disney songs have been a thing. Coco Lee was the voice of Mulan in a Mandarin version of the movie. The 90s was also when Fei Wan made it to the cover of Time magazine. Jackie Chun was invited to perform along the Hong Kong Philharmonic Society. And he then went on to just say, this is great, I'm making a whole musical. And he starred in Snow Wolf Lake. The later 90s, though, were when Canto Pop sales dropped. Canto Pop sales were 1.6 billion in 98. In 2017, 200 million. 1.6 1.6 billion, now 200 million. This is also when people felt like the magic of Canto Pop was no more. There was this very notable buzzed about essay in Billboard in 97 called The Canto Pop Drop that overtly called this the end of their golden days. And Canto Pop sales never recovered since the mid 90s. There were 9.2 million Canto Pop albums sold in 96. 9.2 million. Two years later, 4.9 million. In part, it's because demand changed. Like I said, opening up to cable, satellite, etc. led to more people being exposed to more languages and desiring music and content in those languages so they weren't as interested singularly on getting Cantonese language stuff. Besides global media rise and perceived decline in just the song quality, some of the biggest Canto pop stars and songwriters passed away and no one really picked up the torch the same way again. Meanwhile, C-pop as a whole, still doing pretty well, just not the Canto Pop faction. In 99, Yes Asia, an album distributor, noted that 85% of their pop music sales were thanks to a U.S. customer. The U.S. was buying 85% of Asian pop music from this retailer in 99. So the global interest was there. Plus, the money kept flowing, not from sales, but from those live shows. In 1989, in Hong Kong, they were having maybe one, two, or three alternative shows a year. One to three a year. One to three big standout showcases per year. By 2001, about four a month. In 2001, the Hong Kong Convention Center was popping off. 
the Hong Kong hip hop scene arrived. It was really meant to be a broader culture showcase, but it turned into a huge festival type vibe. Hong Kong has always been known to be this big melting pot of sorts, a big cosmopolitan mix of influences, kind of ahead of the game, trendy, versatile, which may have helped its appeal musically when royalties for just Hong Kong reached 27 million compared with mainland China's 34 million. This was back in 2016. When it comes to similarities and differences, first of all, let's talk about Canto Pop versus Mando Pop, not just language wise. When I say resources shifted to boost Mando Pop instead of Canto Pop, I mean really shifted. Like rock records, once famous for Canto Pop, actually just altogether changed, stopped producing Canto Pop, and opted just for Mando Pop production. Canto Pop became like the out-of-touch older sibling of a hot rising star, and its globalization became kind of a double-edged sword because it did make it then feel in constant competition with Mando Pop for an audience, the same audience. But it did open up and expose the greater world to it, so double-edged sword for it. More exposure, but that means feeling more threatened by more competitors. There also sometimes were not huge incentives to ever go back, so the Canto Pop stars who went to Mando Pop, why would they go back to Canto Pop? For example, Fei Wan, she did okay at Canto Pop, just okay compared to when she released Me in 94, that was her first Mandarin album, topped the charts for months, it was huge. When it comes to K-pop and C-pop, similarities and differences. A key similarity I find to be the way they view it as a full show. Both do now. Like, it's more than just your ears, it's your eyes. How do we visually captivate you with a live show, music videos, etc.? Actually, shows in places like the Hong Kong Coliseum are referred to as show business. Like, it's not a concert. You're going to a show business. You're going to watch a person do what they do for a living as a musician. And they emphasize that in the phrasing. They overtly just acknowledge how music is kind of secondary at a live show. The main reason you're there is visual, is not just the music. That extra, we need to make this experience all-encompassing to listen to this approach is similar to K-pop promo. Plus, there is a lot of K-pop Chinese versions, EXO, most famously, I would say, one of the more famous ones. They also both have, over time, taken from many Western influences, although K-pop, I think, more overtly sought them out. There are actually five different Cantonese covers released at the same time for Wham's Careless Whisper. Plus, big stars in Hong Kong have included Oasis, Ricky Martin, Celine Dion, Elton John. Lots of shows, too, are popular in Hong Kong, like The X-Files and Friends, ER. A difference, though, is in the promo. Not just because of different internet censorship standards and different social media strategies slash lack thereof, with certain apps like Instagram just not being a thing in China, but also promo-wise because China and Japan, to a large extent, really do prioritize physical album listening or their own thing. With J-pop, I guess it would be more physical albums still. China, the focus is like Tencent, leading streaming from specifically Chinese companies. So while other groups are getting their music streaming on worldwide playlists, on Spotify and other global services, China keeps things sometimes more insulated. So promo is similar and different. They have award shows too. They have groups formed on reality shows too that sometimes have a similar training. But the fandom culture is very different. It's quite discouraged. We've talked at length in many past episodes about that. They really do not think highly of how it looks. They view fandoms as yikes, like embarrassing slash potentially harmful to the reputation of the place. On the world stage, they fear fandom culture. They just, they really want to control the image of the artist because the second fans feel so emotionally connected to someone and that someone steps out of line, the whole country is viewed as being in a PR crisis, basically. Fandom activity seems kind of wound up in this worry about reputation maintenance on the world stage. Plus, C-pop stars don't often tour in the U.S. And why would they have to? 
one of the world's biggest economies, one of the biggest places population-wise in the world. There's enough of a population just in China, in mainland China, in Hong Kong. They have enough people in those places to make a living as a famous star without ever setting foot away from those places. So the goals and promo are different. Sonically, they're also different. All pop music does have some root similarities, but C-pop seems to be very less preoccupied with being trimmed down for radio play. Seems like many more C-pop artists than K-pop artists have like five plus minute songs. Really nice long stretched out songs. Plus more ballads, more emotional stuff. Not too worried about staying high tempo. So there are just very different stylistic choices as opposed to K-pop that more overtly hopes to break onto the Western radio and stuff. K-pop also has a lot of details added, like perfect for a call and response, or, you know, a fan chant along with it. The interactive elements, the ways they make it feel extra fun to hear live. C-pop doesn't really worry about that. If you don't find it catchy, whatever, we don't care. C-pop stars, though, have found success promoting on TV, too. Kanto Pop in particular, those stars really became more sought after, had higher brand ranking, basically, after TV drama appearances became more normalized. Sam Hui was a really big early figure for that proof that TV is a good way to reach people with your music, too. Canto rap is different, too. MC Yan, a member of LMF, put it really interesting. In a way, something to the effect of Western rap is focused on race-based oppression more, while Canto rap focuses on class-based oppression. Just an interesting way to put it, that in both cases they use it as an outlet to protest oppression, just in different forms as the focus. Obviously kind of simplified, but still notable way to think about it. And another huge difference with C-pop and any other pop, really, are how the semiotics are. I've done some really interesting nerdy research into semiotics lately. I'll link to it on my site, but the long and short of it is the study of signs and symbols, meaning construction, reveals some interesting stuff about C-pop. That there are these infralinguistic categories, like subliminal messages, subtle signifiers of your intent through what you say, and there's just interesting musicology analysis of C-pop songs with some English. And they note that the C-pop Chinese language in there is orienting the song, truly like the core of the song, the foreground. And the English is a background, the context called a value-added language or language of communication versus a language of identification, a language to help punctuate a punchline or a specific implication or interpretation to help emphasize the primary language. That would be language of communication, whereas Cantonese, Mandarin, languages of identification for people in the group to feel like they got their message across. So it's basically the English is added on top for just extra effect, whereas when writing a K-pop song, the English words are viewed less to emphasize anything, but just to get the syllable count right, to get across something that's hard to translate, different reasons for the switch-offs. Although fan culture has been kind of discouraged in China, it is still there. There was this whole Yujin Soft company-led tour of sorts through China to promote K-pop for the teen demographic, where they had like quizzes, video screenings, kind of like a live theater interactive festival event vibe. And some Chinese fans have really, really resonated with K-pop stars, like NRG, New Radiancy Group, the boy band from 97. That K-pop group, one of its members passed away due to an infection in 2000, and Chinese fans flooded the phone lines and emails to show their condolences and share their memories of him. It's just a great early indicator of truly how much across language barriers people were connecting with this musician. So I'm just saying the picture is very nuanced, very complex. It's not like China is overtly anti-K-pop influence, but their ways of trying to approach it and their ways of approaching C-pop, they're not black and white, not necessarily endorsing K-pop, but they do recognize its potential. They tolerate it. There are, of course, times where stuff is banned. That's a whole other episode. I've gone on long enough. So, who are the C-pop artists to know about? 
I will have a separate episode with all my CPOP recommendations and C-Rock. I have many. But to get you started, CPOP queen from Taiwan, my girl Jill and Sai. Love Jill and Sai. Truly like my personal Madonna. Like, I just think she's such an icon. I really just love her. That's why I did an episode called Jill and Sai's Galaxy. All about her discography. She's incredible. Her dancing, her singing. What pop queen material is made of and more. Other than that, love our chord for C-Rock. His song Love Doesn't Need to Pretend was what really got me into C-Rock, period. The twins set a new standard. They included coupons and bonus goodies in their albums, so they really raised the bar for why you should physically buy an album. They really won over younger audiences, and Canto Pop really forevermore had more success marketing to teens and younger because of the twins. Then there are the four kings of C-pop, the kings of Canto Pop they were dubbed, Andy Lau, Jackie Chun, his overthrow of True Love album, oh my gosh, historic, Leon Lai, and Aaron Kwok. These four are really good at breaking through in a multimedia way and pushing their appeal on several fronts, movies, concerts, etc. Fei Wan is also super notable. She's done Canto Pop and Mando Pop. She has a big USA fan base, actually, although she rarely sings in English. She's known for some big covers, though, of Bjork, The Cranberries. Now, how about C pop versus J pop? I will say that C pop does have some overlap with J pop as well, in terms of promo or lack thereof in certain ways. Also, not everyone followed the Canto Pop to Mando Pop strategy. Like Teresa Tang, she went from Mando Pop to Canto Pop and J Pop. So there is some J Pop crossover of C Pop stars too. Plus, J dramas were in Hong Kong since the 70s. Hong Kong youth have really been drawn to Japanese culture and animations since the 90s. So I predict the future of C Pop is pretty similar to what it is now, the present of C Pop. The trend will stay M Pop more popular than C Pop, Cantonese Pop. And the stars will not get the buzz of a K-pop star or even a J-pop star, partly in a way that's not because they couldn't if they tried, but they don't try. Now, certain stars like Jill and Sai, who have incredible live shows, really wanted to see the Ugly Beauty Tour live, really want to see that come to the USA. I'm just, ugh, love that so much. Anyway, stars like her who really put on quite a show with dancing and stuff and have tons of past musical eras. Each era is very specific to a character of hers in a way. Those performers seem to have so much potential for universal appeal. Plus she's had some Western collabs, Rehab, Max, and Steve Aoki. She's also worked with Madonna in a way. Jolene actually recorded a Chinese version of a Madonna audiobook for kids. She is Western fans like me. <laughs> so I do think C-Pop could still have a home in like with the Fei Wan fans. Here, I just, it's kind of just at a plateau, I see. Especially if you, which we don't have time for, but if you got into the geopolitics of this and just how tensions are high with China and the US, but they also need each other, some of the world's biggest economies and partners economically and adversaries economically and elsewise. So many complications there that make the touring possibilities not great so it's it's a lot it's very messy and unpredictable but i just i can only predict that things will stay predictable in terms of not much expansion of interest but also pretty stagnant interest so not fading either unpredictable are everything else every element in the future but popularity wise i'm predicting there isn't much there but we'll see where the trends go more to say and my specific recs on a new episode, so thank you all for tuning into this one today, and I will talk to you all again very soon. Bye, everybody!